Welcome everybody to the Beards and Bible Podcast. My name is Josh, and I'm joined by Gabe. Hmm. Gabe, how you doing, man? I'm doing well. Doing well. You guys did a good job in my absence last episode. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's a heavy topic to discuss, and I felt like you guys did it uh, did it justice. So, thanks, man. Bravo. But did you did you know any Gothardites in your? I uh, didn't. Your dealings? No. No, I didn't. I didn't. I see. I didn't really grow up in that. My my family was uh, pretty much majority just public school. Just uh, yeah. Yeah, you so missed I, out. I didn't, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I feel cheated. Yeah. Well, Darn let me you, ask you mom this. and dad. You've been friends with me for twenty years. Mm-hmm. Did you ever know that about me? I mean, I think I had tried to explain that mm-hmm. to you a couple of times, but did you ever know how, like, the extent to which we were involved in that homeschool cult? I did not know that. I mean, I knew you grew up in a homeschool family, and you know, you guys were all very musically inclined it seemed like you're a very conservative kind of more traditional family and mm-hmm. but i mean that, that was pretty common um especially in the 90s and evangelical christian 80s and 90s but yeah. no i didn't know i didn't know all that so oh well, there you go yeah. that's probably the weirdest part about that episode is like uh so many people over the years i tried to allude and explain to them how ATI and LBLP was, and nobody ever quite knew what we were talking about. And then that documentary came out, mm. and people are coming out of the woodwork <laughs> texting me, and holy cow, this is what you guys grew up in. Mm. So, yeah, I like the part where you said that you and Jenny watched it together, and you were like, Jenny, at the end of it was like, oh wow, you like now I understand like so much more. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, man. Well, how you been? Yeah. I've been hot. Man, like summer is full swing down here in southern Alabama. Mm, down in L.A., yeah. lower Alabama. Yeah, yeah you man. boy. Have you been uh, starting your marathon training? No, no, I haven't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm putting it off as long as possible. Uh, <laughs> no, I've just been doing the normal working out in the gym thing and just trying to stay in shape, but yeah, I'm, just so hot man i get out and the the trails behind our house are just like they're kind of in this little wetlands area anyway so by the time you get home from work and you're already tired from work and it's been 90 degrees all day and you know tmi but you're already like chafing in places you don't want to be chafing anymore in and the last thing you want to do is that is a concern yeah yes last thing you want to do is get out and run in this muggy swamp of a nature preserve and Uh, oppressive swamps yeah mm. I'm really mm-hmm. spoiled because I work inside all day, and so by the time the end of my day arrives when I come home, that's the perfect time after the kids go to bed to uh, mm-hmm. get out and run when it's nice and cool. So yeah, yeah. Well, good for you. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you're you're going to start right after me, hopefully. So I yeah, hope that you uh, yeah yeah we're gonna or definitely do this together, there, bud. I think I'm going to condense it down though, like my training schedule. <sighs> I'm just going to do uh, like just start off just doing a 10 mile Sunday, then doing like a 13 mile, then to 16, just training right up to 20 uh, mm. back to back like that. And we'll just see and, and just condense it down. Last night, last year I dragged it out over like six months and that was just kind of grueling. I actually trained yeah. up to like 15 miles and then summer hit. And then I just stopped or I just kind of dialed back mm-hmm. and kind of just dragged it out over the summer and had, had mediocre runs and then the fall hit again. And then I kind of, amped it back up but i think it just kind of took a toll on my free time and projects sure. around the house and in life in general but we'll see and you still survived the marathon mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah see i'm i'm terrified man like i think that's yeah. why i'm so like i'm really 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 um like religious about my training at this point because i'm so scared mm-hmm. i'm gonna like just be out there embarrass myself and or die yeah yeah <laughs> that was my that's... my goal was like to survive it <laughs> And now that I've survived my first one, now it's like, okay, let's see if I can beat my time, which, yeah. yeah. So the fear factor is gone. Now it's like kind of a dread, but also uh, it's a dread mixed with like, why am I doing this uh, Mm. again? But, but also uh, looking forward to it. But yeah, like the, the question of, can I survive 26.2 miles in one day just running? 
the, uh, that, that's been answered. Yes, I'm capable of doing that. But okay. It's like, okay. Yeah. But that's well, you're, yeah. You're I think you're you're absolutely you're 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 absolutely capable of doing it. You just okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Speaking of dread, mm-hmm. the Dread Scott decision. Mm. Mm. That was <laughs> a <laughs> bit of a <laughs> a bit of a a bit of a stretch there. <laughs> Uh, for uh, as far as segues go, yeah, you're not talking about the Dred Scott decision that was the U.S. Supreme Court's ruling on March 6, 1857, that having oh lived in a free state and territory did not title and save person Dred Scott to his freedom, are you? You know, as a matter of fact, I think I am. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I think about what that, does that have stuff to, all the time. What does that have to do with this week's episode? Though? Well, let me tell you something. So there's a summer reading program at the library in the town that we live in. Right, so follow me. Follow me with this. Mm-hmm. Right, mm-hmm. all right. So the kids are doing this summer reading program with like, you know, ventriloquists and puppets. And my youngest, he's terrified of puppets. And so, mm. good for him. Sometimes, yeah. Sometimes he can't sit through the program, and so I'll take him to the little back kids room and whatever. So, a couple of weeks ago, we're back there. The kids are looking at books. My wife's hanging out with the kids, and I notice in the genealogy room and local Mm. history room in our library there are four books there's a volume of the confederate army their entire rank and roster from 1861 to 1865 so yeah so i had been told by my family for generations that i had an ancestor that fought in the civil war his name was john william brooker right <clears throat> so I go to this volume and I look him up and sure enough, there he is, John William Brooker. And I see him and I'm like, oh gosh, that's okay. That's his name. Let me see if I can pull up exactly what I found. And so as then I start looking up what it says about him, it says that he was in the 39th Infantry, Company B, and he was a first lieutenant. Hmm. Right? So then I start looking up, okay, the 39th Regiment of the Georgia Infantry, what did they do? And I found on, I think it was like the U.S. National Park Service or some website like that, that the 39th Infantry Regiment was organized in Dalton, Georgia. That's my hometown. Hmm. And it had members of Whitfield County, Bartow County, Dade, Fayette, Clayton, Chattahoochee, and Butts, which, yes, there is a Butts County, Georgia. Laugh it up. Uh and then it lists all the battles that they fought in. So they were at the Vicksburg campaign. They had a battle that they fought at Champions Hill. Hmm. And then they were involved in a prisoner exchange because I guess they were captured at Vicksburg. And then they were sent back. And basically they fought all the way from Chattanooga down to Atlanta and to Savannah. Wow. Yeah. And it's kind of crazy because, like, I'd always heard about that, you know, okay, I have a ancestor that um, fought in the Civil War, and then all of a sudden I find that there he is. That's really cool. Yeah. So it's just kind of interesting that there's that history of my family. That's a big part of, <clears throat> you know, the family heritage, not necessarily – um. You know, we'll talk about the causes of the Civil War and why people fought. It's yet to uh, be determined, and we'll probably never know why exactly this ancestor of mine fought. But if you grew up in the South, chances are you probably have stories like that, or you have family stories of how people fought and where they fought. And my hometown, Mm. I remember walking around and seeing earthworks that were formed by Confederate soldiers in the winter of 1864. And so it's just like a big part of history, like where I grew up in the state of Georgia. Hmm. But well, you live in Alabama, so it's probably the same yeah. for you, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I, I have this interesting uh, dynamic where my ancestors on my dad's side likely fought for the South, and the ancestors on my mom's side likely fought for the North. Oh, wow. Um but we should we should back up, and for those who are either a uh, 
uneducated on the American Civil War and living in the United States, or they're just outside the United States, so they have no idea what we're talking about, the Civil War. Yes. They're just, yes. They have very cursory, but um, yep. let's go through and kind of do a quick overview because it kind of, this kind of set the historical backdrop of, of the topic. That's I think that's really important to get into with talking about Civil War memorials and, and such, but yeah, absolutely. Um, for those who don't know, uh, maybe we could take these every other one if you want, Josh. Sure. Um, the Civil War was a war fought in American soil uh, between 1861 and 1865 between the United States and 11 southern states that what we call seceded from the Union and formed the Confederate States of America. So they formed a separate sovereign nation, or at least attempted to, uh, that composed was composed of 11 states. Um, and uh, so yeah, it's a four-year conflict between the North and the South, primarily. There's a, a line drawn down between them called the Mason-Dixon line is kind of what separated the North and the South. Yeah. Yeah, and it was a big, big deal. Um, more than 3 million men fought in the war. And uh, neutrality was a thing. Like, there were some states that were completely neutral, and there were some people within those states that were neutral. But for the most part... <clears throat> men within fighting age, you know, you you would fight. You would go to war. Um, either you were drafted in the north or you were conscripted in the south. But, yeah, three million men fought in the war, so it was a big deal. Mm. And casualties and that, were really high, too. Yeah, yeah. So that would have been, um, let me see, there was about 2% of the population that would have, 2% of the population that would have, um, died in the Civil War, which is about 620,000 uh, people died in the Civil War. Now, U.S. casualties, just to give you a frame of reference, U.S. Ca US casualties in World War II was 405,399. So this was... Wow. This is the bloodiest conflict ever in American history so mm -hmm. far as the Civil War. Yeah, um, and so the battles that were fought, like... Uh the Battle of Shiloh here in Tennessee. And in two days at the Battle of Shiloh, more Americans fell in two days than all the previous American wars combined in two days. Mm. That's crazy. So like the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812. Yep. Um, yeah, that's crazy. War. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one, of the, one such battle was the Battle of Antietam. Uh, bloodiest day, bloodiest single day of the Civil War. Uh, 12,401 Union soldiers were killed, missing or wounded, uh, double the casualties of the D-Day uh, during World War II, hmm. 82, which happened 82 years later. So you would think with all this like modern weaponry and bombs and airplanes and jets, well, not jets, but um, tanks and everything else, flamethrowers, you'd think we would, we would right. have more casualties in this one day of the D-Day. But that's not the case. So a total, a total of Battle of Antietam saw 23,000 casualties on both sides. Um, like I said, it was the bloodiest single day of the Civil War. Wow. Yeah, Cold Harbor, Virginia, that's another battle. And uh, 7,000 Americans fell in 20 minutes. Like we can't even, we can't even fathom. That's yeah. like, um, like the town I grew up in uh, for all of my middle school and high school years. I think had a had a population of six thousand people total, <laughs> so that's like that's like at one battle in twenty minutes more the entire more than the entire population of the, of my hometown wow. gone, just dead. That's that's just I can't even I can't even picture that. Yeah, well, and where I'm at here in uh, just outside of Murfreesboro, Tennessee, Murfreesboro had a battle, the Battle of Stones River, in 1863. And um, I'd have to look up the stats on that. But, I mean, it was a very, very bloody battle. And, um, you know, it was always a big thing. What do you do with all these bodies after the wars, you know, after the battle? <clears throat> and so there is a massive cemetery there at the battlefield that you can go to even now, um, you know, to see all these bodies of, of the guys that would have fallen. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for why it was such a um, a bloody war. One of the things that was different about um, the Civil War is that the rifles that were used um, were not balls <coughs> that they shot anymore. It weren't, weren't like musket balls that they shot in the American Revolution. They were actually rifled. They were called mini balls. Mm -hmm. So it's like a bullet that you would have in a rifle cartridge now. 
Mm-hmm. So the effective range of rifles was a lot farther in the Civil mm-hmm. War than it had been in the previous Napoleonic Wars. So they had better weaponry, not just from the infantry riflemen, but also from the artillery. So they had rifled artillery as well. But they were still using the kind of battlefield tactics that they would have used like in the Revolutionary Mm. War or the War of 1812. So, you know, you get in your mind a picture of guys lining up in a field and just walking towards each other. Wow. So it'd be like... um... It'd be like trench warfare during World War II, but the utilization of drones and dropping right, right, exactly. you know, ordinances via drones. Like it's that level of, it's, yeah. yeah, it's interesting, that kind of blending of, of technologies and, and warfare methodology. Yeah. Um, so we covered some of the, the uh, I guess the bullet points, you would say, of the history of the Civil War. Um, explain to us what would be the cause of the civil war. So like, if you, if you have no idea what the civil war is, yeah. t- tell me like, why did we fight with ourselves as a, as a nation? Right, right, right. Yeah. So, um, this is from the U S national park service website. So this is written by historians that would be respected kind of experts on this, but this is what they had to say about the cause of the civil war for more than 80 years. People in the Northern and Southern States had been debating the issues that ultimately led to war, economic policies and practices, cultural values, the extent and reach of the federal government, and most importantly, the role of slavery within American society. Against the backdrop of these larger issues, individual soldiers had their own reasons for fighting. Their motivations often included a complex mix <coughs> excuse me, of personal, social, economic, and political values that didn't necessarily match the aims expressed by their respective governments. Hmm. So like most responsible historians will say, you know, there's a lot of things that went into it. The linchpin issue would have been slavery. Mm-hmm. And if the states had the right to decide whether or not they wanted to be states where slavery was legal. Mm. So, unfortunately, I think there is a pretty dramatic oversimplification in the minds of a lot of people where when you say the American Civil War, it becomes the moral issue of slavery. Mm -hmm. And so everybody that fought for the North, they were on a moral crusade to free the slaves. And everybody that fought for the South, they were, you know, foaming at the mouth, white supremacists. And that's what it was about. And, um, that's pretty, that's a pretty dramatic oversimplification. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? Yeah. And I think it goes back to the, the bedrock of this whole debate really started at the founding of our nation between some of the founding fathers like Hamilton and Jefferson if you're not familiar mm-hmm. with those guys, one argued for... I've seen the musical, yeah. Yeah. One argued, <laughs> like Jeff, Jefferson argued for what would be called the Federalist position, which basically says that we need a strong central government yeah. to hold to hold the, the nation together. Whereas the, um, the position that maybe people like Hamilton took would be uh, what they call themselves Democratic Republicans, Democratic Republicans, <laughs> which held that that the state government should be stronger than the central government. So this argument Jefferson took that state. Jeff, right, took right. That stance that the state government should be stronger. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Hamilton took that stance. Uh, so, okay. yeah, you have you have this debate already happening at the right. founding of our nation between these two kind of camps that should should we have a strong central government that might kind of tiptoe itself towards more of a tyrannical state. See, they were really weary of having a strong central government because that they think that would lend itself to to tyranny, which is what they ultimately <coughs> were trying to escape right. by by the re- revolution in, in you know separating itself from the British Empire. So um, the other side, the other end of the spectrum, would be like having strong states, having a central government, but the states. So you almost looked at yourself, um, and this is still the case in some places. Some people see themselves as Tennessee in first and American second. I know that sounds weird to some people, but um, back 100 years ago, you would have very much taken a great deal of pride in the fact that you were from Tennessee or you're a Georgian or you're right. Alabamian, and you saw that as um, your 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 almost your number one identity marker over being part of the United States of America. Because yeah. um, in the South, it just so happened that there was a lot more sentiment towards having stronger states and a weaker central government 
because they they wanted to stay away from a strong government because a strong central federal government because they figured that would ultimately lead towards a tyrannical government which would erode the the rights and the the privileges of everyday America. Yeah, so most historians will agree that the economics of slavery and the political control of that system that would give the states the rights to own slaves, that was really what the conflict was about, right? Mm -hmm. So does the state have the right to say here in Georgia or here in Alabama or here in Mississippi, this is what we're going to do. You may do it differently up there, but down here we're going to do it this way. Or does the federal government have the right to say, no, across the entire United States, this is how we're going to do it, right? Mm -hmm. And and so in the South, the massive economy driver was cotton. And so how did these big plantations make money? Well, they made money because they had slaves that could work the cotton fields. The northern states were primarily industrial states. And so their economy was driven by industry. And so, um, yeah, I mean, so, so yeah, it was about slavery, but it was about more than slavery. So it's, uh, it's a little bit more complex than just to say it was about a moral crusade to, to end a certain thing. And it was all about racism. And I want to go on the record and say like 100% Gabe and I are talking about history. (laughs) So I believe slavery is wrong. Gabe believes slavery is wrong. Um, 100% 100% the Bible would say it is too. So please don't, mm-hmm. you know, misunderstand what we're saying. We're just trying to talk about this from just a historical mm-hmm. um, perspective on that. Yeah. So uh, what's interesting is about 75 to 80% of Confederate soldiers did not own slaves. Hmm. So 20 to 25% of them would have owned slaves or lived in families that owned slaves. And most of the time, slave owners were wealthy plantation owners. Hmm. <clears throat> but this has Which been is, going on. Go ahead. Well, that, that begs the question: like, if seventy-five to eighty percent of those fighting in the Civil War on the, you know, we could say pro-slavery side in the Confederate Confederate Army, if they didn't even own slaves, so that that automatically tells you they must have, in their minds, been fighting for something else other than other than just the issue of slavery. Um, and and so that yeah they they saw this as a very complex issue as well that maybe maybe they saw um they saw the potential here for the federal government becoming too strong and and you would see literature as you know and letters and stuff and and people in the confederate army calling this the war of northern aggression is how a lot right, of and, and right, right, right. right or wrong i don't i don't know it is not what I'm, I'm not picking sides here i'm just saying that that's how the average confederate soldier would have viewed this conflict yeah, there, there were decidedly racist people in the Confederacy. No, mm-hmm. no question about it. I mean, we have some of their writings. So there was white supremacy going on, un- undoubtedly. But to say that that was representative of everyone who was fighting is inaccurate. Just, just period. I mean, that's you. You have to just completely ignore, you know, the <clears throat> the history behind it. Um, mm-hmm. And so the issue of slavery was a huge issue that had been a part of the U.S. since its founding. I mean, George Washington was a slave owner. Thomas Jefferson was a slave owner. Andrew Jackson (laughs) was a slave owner, right? So there were all of these um, people that even now you can look back in your history books and see them as a, you know, founding father, whatever else they are, but they were slave owners and, um, yeah, so a, a very messy, complex, not squeaky clean or whitewashed history we have as Americans, <laughs> right? Yeah, it never is. Yeah, so um, the struggle against slavery was something that led directly to the creation of the Republican Party. So abolition and, and abolitionist efforts kind of led to that. And when Abraham Lincoln was elected, southern states kind of saw the, the writing on the wall and said he's going to... Um, he's basically going to free the slaves and that's going to lead to the South going bankrupt and he doesn't have the right to do that. And so they seceded and then the rest is history. As they say, those events led to the war. And and really for the first two or three years, Lincoln would himself go on record to say that his fight was to preserve the union. It wasn't to free the slaves. Hmm. 
the Emancipation Proclamation was not until 1863. Mm -hmm. And that was when it kind of became more about <clears throat> freeing the slaves than it did about preserving the Union. Because um, a lot of historians speculate that perhaps his desire in the beginning days of the war was to preserve the Union and to say to the slave owning states, you guys can figure this out on your own timing, but just at least stay in the Union, right? Hmm. We could look at it similar to the issue of abortion right now in the United States of America, too. Sure. Um, you know, the Supreme Court struck down the decision of Roe v. Wade, but that didn't, that didn't criminalize uh, abortion in the United States of America. That just kicked it back to the 50 states for them to decide what they should do about abortion. Right. And that's how a lot of people viewed the issue of slavery. It was a very divisive issue at the time. And there was already a large abolitionist movement that was growing um, organically within the United States. Um, and some people would speculate and say that it would have eventually been abolished even had it not been for the Emancipation Proclamation. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, it was kind of like Southerners maybe viewed it as, okay, let us decide what we should do with slavery and we'll we'll do away with it if that's you know if that's the moral thing to do if that's the popular thing to do according to our our voting um populace but no, yeah no. it's all about it's all about precedence and setting precedence in in the sense that like if a if a leader of a nation can make a sweeping edict like that um who's to say a leader down the road who has immoral intent can't do the same thing um and that's the thing that you're handing us kind of like a blank check over to a leader. It's, it's, you know, obviously, and, and we said this, like slavery is evil. Racism is evil. Um, it's, it's interesting because, um, had it been some other issue, like, like, you know, whether or not cigarettes <laughs> you know, can, should right, be smoked right, 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 in, right. in restaurants, it's like a much more benign issue. It'd been yeah. interesting to see how it played out, but, sure. um, unfortunately it came, it came to war, you know? Yeah. So it is, um, quite historically inaccurate to say that everyone who fought for the North was on a moral crusade to free the slaves and everyone who fought for the South was a white supremacist. Mm. That's very historically inaccurate. Um, just to say it's only about slavery and race is just incorrect. But it's also historically incorrect to say that the Civil War wasn't at all about slavery and race. It certainly was. That was a linchpin issue. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. But, um, yeah, complex thing if you're an American to deal with it. And really after the war, that's when the South really became, I think, what people think of when they think of the South, you know, people sitting around in <laughs> overalls without their shirts, plucking banjos, you know, living in a ramshackled house with, you know, four dogs laying around and, uh, you know, because like... Uh, the Southern economy had been strong and vibrant before the Civil War because of cotton. And so after that, the economy had been just absolutely decimated. $3.3 .3 billion lost, which I don't even know what that would be in today's dollars, but just absolutely destroyed. <clears throat> so, um, yeah. Cities, towns, farms were destroyed. 40% of the South's livestock had been killed. There were no slaves to work former plantations, and over a quarter of Southern white men of military age had died during the war. So those years following the Civil War were called the Reconstruction years, <clears throat> and those were really, really, really hard years in the American South. Hmm. There's a book... Um called War Crimes uh, let me look it up real fast War Crimes Against Southern Civilians and um, you know when when Lincoln gathered his, his generals around and said basically we're going towards the end of the war we're going to wage total war against the south um, there were some great atrocities committed against just men, women, and children like non-combatants um, if you look up, you know, Sherman's March to the Sea or the Siege mm -hmm. of Atlanta and the Burning of Atlanta, I mean, people, uh, the massacre of St. Um, Louis in Missouri, um, 
I mean, there's, the list goes on. I mean, people were, entire farms were completely pillaged by the Union armies and um, people's, yeah. people's uh, livelihoods were just completely uh, destroyed. Uh, rape, murder, um, looting, you name it. Um, it's, it's just an ugly, ugly war. Yeah. So that was kind of, if you're not American or maybe you needed a little brush up history lesson, that's what we're talking about when we talk about the American Civil War. <clears throat> so that was fought in 1861 to 1865. And in recent years, um, the American Civil War has been something that it's almost like you can't talk about it. Mm-hmm. Um, you can't even, if you research it too much and you get too into studying about the Confederacy, um, being interested in it just from a historical perspective in the minds of some is you're equated to be a white supremacist or a racist. Mm. <clears throat> and there's a reason for that. And so I actually, there's a lot of incidences when I started studying it this afternoon to put together the show notes. I was like, man, I've, I remember this, but I haven't thought about this in years. It just seems like so much has happened, but really it kind of seems like a lot of this fervor kind of against um, I don't know, against seeing the Civil War in a objective light started in 2015 when um, a young man by the name of Dylan Roof, who was a 21-year-old self-professed white supremacist, walked into a Bible study at an African-American, an African-American church in Charleston, South Carolina, and he killed nine people. Do you remember that, Gabe, the Charleston mm-hmm. church shooting? Yeah, yeah, I remember that. And so um, <clears throat> he was obsessed with white supremacist ideology. He ran a website that was all about it, and uh, apparently he was obsessed with the Confederacy and Confederate flags. And for him, the Confederate flags represented racism. He, he had a, a, a very just evil hatred of black people. And so um, the governor of South Carolina at the time, Nikki Haley, ordered the Confederate flags around, like, I think their their flag was half Confederate, I think, at the time. But anyway, she ordered those down. And uh, in the two years that followed after the Charleston church shooting, eight Confederate memorials were removed kind of as a response to that. So that was a pretty... That was a pretty shocking and and sobering um, incident that happened. I think that's kind of where, in the minds of some people, the Confederacy and Civil War history kind of got tied to white supremacy um, Mm. through that young man. So, yeah, talk about uh, the Unite the Right rally, Gabe, in Charlottesville. Yeah, in 2017, um, the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, which groups of other self-professed white supremacists marched with Nazi flags and mixed together with Confederate flags. Uh, someone actually ended up driving a car into a crowd and injured 35 people and killed one person. And then within three years, 114 monuments were removed. Yeah, golly, man. Do you remember, did you ever see video footage from that rally? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. That's pretty crazy. It was a bunch of dudes walking around with torches chanting they will not replace us because i guess it started because they were trying to remove a statue of robert e lee in charlottesville and so they were protesting the removal of that statue um and of course the they and they will not replace us was um ethnic minorities replacing whites so Mm. to those folks there flying a Nazi flag mixed with a Confederate flag, it very much was a symbol for white supremacy. Um, Yeah. So right, wrong, or indifferent, that's what happened, and more than 160 Confederate monuments and memorials have been removed from public spaces in the U.S. since 2015. Hmm. Um, Some of them were by state and local governments, But like in 2020, I don't know if you remember all of the BLM riots of 2020. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was rioters that would rip them down, cover them with paint, um, put blindfolds over them, things like that. 
Hmm. Um, so yeah, that's why some of them came down because of riots and protests. You know, uh, Lakeland, Florida, where we went to college, um, had a Confederate soldier on a, uh, on a big pedestal in the center of the city in, in Munn Park. It was a little center, little square hmm. in downtown Lakeland. And uh, do you remember that? that I'm Confederate... trying to remember. What was the name of the park again? Munn Park. Munn Park. Yeah, I don't remember Munn Park. Yeah, it's a little, it's a little square right in the middle of town. And uh, hmm. the city of Lakeland solicited for people's opinions, which I don't know. Like they did it, I think, on social media, whether or not they should remove the Confederate statue. And I think it was actually majority wanted to keep it as a part of their history and heritage as a city um, because there were a lot of people that left Polk County to go fight in the Civil War for the Confederate Army and then hmm. many, many were lost. So it was just kind of a memorial to help remember those who were lost in the fighting. But eventually, yeah, it was taken down and they kind of came to a compromise and they moved the statue from the center of Lakeland over to the Veterans uh, Cemetery kind of on hmm. the outskirts, more on the outskirts of town and it, it kind of overlooks the Confederate dead uh part yeah. of the cemetery um so that's that's interesting that it kind of you know i guess hits home it, oddly enough i'm sure. in here in yeah. southern alabama and you would think there would be some kind of confederate <laughs> statues but I, I guess there are i can't think of any in in my town here in dothan alabama hmm. uh, any confederate statues or anything the only thing that hits close to home is i live close to what was fort rucker and i guess rucker was a confederate general and they've just recently changed all the military installations, uh, federal federal installations that are named after Confederate generals are being changed now, and hmm. now it's now it's Fort Novacell this year. So, interesting. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. So, yeah. Here's here's what the the controversy is, and we'll go ahead and just jump in. Like, it starts with the question of why were the statues ever put up in the first place, right? Mm -hmm. And historians and scholars and social commentators are completely divided on this one hmm. um some historians scholars and social commentators say they were put up to preserve history and to mourn and honor the confederate dead who died fighting for a cause they believed in and to defend you know what they saw as their homeland right the state of alabama the state of georgia mm -hmm. the state of whatever <laughs> and so um most of these monuments were built in the early 1900s and that kind of went along with the 50 year anniversary of the Civil War. So if you think about it, there were probably Confederate veterans who were in their 70s and 80s, they were dying off. These would have been the fathers and grandfathers of many of the people who were policymakers. And so they'd probably grown up here and their dad and granddad tell stories about fighting in the war and this, that, and the other. And so in a Southern state, they're thinking, let's let's honor these guys, <clears throat> you know, they they've, fought for Alabama, they fought for Georgia, they fought for, you know, um, South Carolina, whatever else it is. Um, what makes that tricky is, as soon as the Civil War ended, former Confederates started writing literature. It started in 1866 with Edward Pollard. He wrote a book called The Lost Cause, A New Southern History of the War of the Confederates. Former Confederate General Jubal Early, he wrote articles in 1870s in the 1870s, and then Jefferson Davis, which he was the president of the Confederacy, <laughs> so not exactly an objective person, right? Mm. He wrote a volume called The Rise and Fall of the Confederate Government. And so most historians will call their philosophy the lost cause myth. And it was this, the Civil War had nothing to do with slavery. It was only about preserving and protecting the South. Mm. And so it was almost like a case of Monday morning quarterback, right? So looking back on your decisions 10 years previous and saying, well, I was justified in making that because what I was really doing was this, right? Mm -hmm. So many people in the South in the early 1900s would have preferred that version of history because if it wasn't about slavery, Confederate generals and soldiers, they were heroes. They were protecting the South. Mm -hmm. That's what mm -hmm. they were doing. So why wouldn't we put up monuments for them? They were, they were being noble. They were being heroic, right? Hmm. And so that's, yeah, that's what kind of makes it complicated because at the time they were put up, there were probably policymakers and mayors and senators that were thinking, yeah, this doesn't have anything to do with racism. 
this is about remembering those who fought to die, um, fought and died, you know, defending our state, right? Mm -hmm. But others would say, no, that's not it at all. If you look at what was happening in the early 1900s in the South, that's what we call the Jim Crow era of the South. And what people were doing in the Jim Crow era of the South is they were trying to intimidate African Americans and reaffirm white supremacy. And so what the monuments were, because they were built during the Jim Crow era South, is they were built as a means to reinforce a Southern identity of white supremacy and to keep blacks in their place. So, yeah. What say ye? What do you think about that? Yeah. I mean, it probably depends on, I mean, everyone probably had different motivations. Um, sure. Yeah, they probably were both represented. Um, I mean, you got to think, like, there's there's whole towns and cities that sent up their young men to fight what they likely believe to be a fight against an overreaching federal government, a, <laughs> a tyrannical government. And they never came back. Yeah. So if you could imagine, you know, all your young men being gone and mothers and fathers and families mourning for, for generations over that, um, there's a lot of emotions tied up in that. But at the same sure. time, yeah, th there could be this, uh, this, this 50 year revival of saying, well, let's, um, let's stoke the flames of, of, southern identity once again or mm -hmm. um yeah it absolutely could be su su racial supremacy involved um and that's that's the essence of it it's like th there's such a convoluted nuanced issue mm -hmm. that to say that every monument was put there because um people had racial racist intentions is is such an oversimplification yeah i mean do you think it's <laughs> Is it impossible to know why they were put up and what they represented to the people that would have put them up? Because, I mean, there are plaques mm. that will tell you, yeah. you know, this was erected for the purpose of honoring, you know, this person who did this or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, they, they, they're put there. I mean, the one in Lakeland, I think, was to honor those who died in the Civil War. You know, those those on the Confederacy right. who died in the Civil War. <clears throat> um, and, you know, it's like, it doesn't sound all that bad. But I think... It's, it's interesting, though, and this has always struck me as interesting, is like only in the United States of America can you have a civil war and the, the team that loses, the army that, that loses the civil war, is allowed to put up statues and, and wave flags that represented that losing team. Right. <laughs> and I think that's that one side that's like, hmm, that could be problematic. But the other side, it's like, wow, that really speaks to the freedoms and the liberties we have in the United States of America that, you know, mm -hmm. any other place in the world, you, you try that in North Korea, like, you know, they're going <laughs> to, you know, you're going to be sent to a work camp the rest of your life, you know? <laughs> right, and so right, 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 right. I think that's yeah. really, it's really neat in a way, if I can say that, like, but mm. um, the same time, it's such a sensitive issue to do that, um, that we have to be, we have to be really careful, but so I think there's like pros and cons of taking down statues or renaming military bases or renaming yeah. streets and changing state flags. There's pros and cons to that because sure. you don't want to get into a, a trap of potentially erasing historical events or disrespecting um, people people whose, whose lives were greatly changed because of this conflict. You don't want to disrespect them. Sure. Um, but at the same time, you've got people who see that as symbols of uh, white supremacy or slavery or preserving the institution of slavery. Right. Um, so that's interesting. But, I mean, some pros of taking down the statues would be like that statues misrepresent, the statues misrepresent history and glorify people who perpetuated slavery, attempted cessation from the United States, and lost the Civil War. And, you know, they could be like a painful reminder of past or present institutionalized race, racism. Um, there, there are many people other, uh, are many other people who, who could be represented by statutes who would better represent the historical progress and diversity of the country. 
So, you know, you could put like a, a memorial up in the middle of, of Lakeland, Florida, or wherever you are, that is like, uh, just says, you know, it's like a, like a, a wreath or something with a eternal flame in the middle. It's just those who lost their lives in the, in the civil war, you know, and it, it could yeah. be something more neutral than that. <clears throat> yeah. Well, somebody but would say cons. Yeah. Like yeah. if you look at the cons, I mean, these statues represent the country's history. I mean, there was a war. It was fought by people from the South that whatever their reason for fighting, they still fought. And no matter how complicated that might be, it still happened. So taking them down would be to censor, to whitewash and potentially just forget that history. Right? Just to say <clears throat> to your kids two generations from now, well, there was a civil war that was fought. What was it fought about? There were people who were racist and that's bad. Hmm. All right. Well, how did that actually <laughs> flesh itself out? Right? I mean, how does that, you know, mm -hmm. um, if you forget this is, your history, you could potentially repeat it, right? Right, right. This is the <clears> same <throat> reason why uh, worldwide Judaism does not want places like Auschwitz being bulldozed, right? Mm, that's they want that to stay there as a constant reminder that this is the the dark depths that humanity can can fall to. Um, but at the same time, Auschwitz is not the center of the Jewish faith or Jewish identity. The right. Torah, the Torah is sure. Judaism is as a religion um, that is sort of off to the side and something that we should know about and be cognizant of and avoid in the future at all costs. Uh, mm -hmm. So I would say that there is a case to be made that if you have a Confederate statue in the center of your city and everything is oriented to that, I could see how that could be potentially problematic and very, very sure. incendiary. Um, if yeah. you, if, if like all focus is on that, does that make mm -hmm. sense? Oh yeah. Well, one of the biggest cons that a lot of you hear a lot of people say is that if you start removing the statues, that's a slippery slope because that could lead to the removal of monuments for any slightly problematic person. Mm. Right. <clears throat> so here in Tennessee, um, there is the Hermitage, which is the home of President Andrew Jackson. Hmm. So you can go take a tour. We took the kids last year for a homeschool field trip of the Hermitage, and we got to see like a museum of the Andrew Jackson presidency. We got to see a stagecoach that he rode into the inauguration, and we got to see his home that he built, and it was amazing. But we also saw slave quarters, hmm. right? And... One could say, well, Andrew Jackson was a horrible man. He's responsible for the Trail of Tears and the Indian Removal Act. And mm -hmm. yes, he is. And that was horrible. He shouldn't have done that. And <clears throat> Andrew Jackson should never have owned slaves. Owning another person is immoral and wrong on so many levels. Mm -hmm. But he was also an American president. And if you remove any mention of Andrew Jackson from American history, you don't quite get the full picture of how America became America today, right? Mm -hmm. So if you have to go through and remove all these statues of undesirable, problematic people, you crack the door open to say, okay, you got to get rid of Mount Vernon and George Washington. Mm -hmm. You got to get rid of Monticello and Thomas Jefferson. You've got to get rid of the Hermitage and Andrew Jackson. You got to go down the list and basically... Mm -hmm hold all of these people up to the standard of morality in 2023 from 200 years ago. And I just don't know if that's wise or even reasonable. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. That's a very slippery slope. And yeah, you can only keep the statues of perfect people. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah which, which I would exist. love to know how that works. Like in the city of Rome with the emperors and stuff like that. Like mm. last time I checked, there were slave owners, but. And, and I think, like I said, there's a there's a, a case to be made. Like Andrew Jackson's stuff, all that all that is not. It's not sitting in the National Mall in Washington D.C. It's it's peripheral, and I think it's I think it's good that it's there and it stays there, and we know about the life of Andrew Jackson. I think that's good and healthy, but at the same time, it's it, it, in my mind it, it should stay on the periphery of. Mm -hmm. You know, when you take something and you put it on an obelisk, you're saying, I honor and I like this and I Yeah, you I should want emulate to this person. This. this is a hero. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. And then we take that obelisk with the person sitting on top of it, and you put it in the center of your government, and you know everything's looking at it. Uh, you're saying, okay, we, this is, this is something we cherish and and long for and and look yeah. up to. Sure. So another con would be someone would say, the statues don't cause racism, right? Nobody is morally neutral with the issue of racism and looks at the statue and says, wow, that person was a racist. I think I will be too. Um, and, and like you mentioned with, you know, keeping Auschwitz and Treblinka and all these, you know, concentration camps open, it could be used to actually fight racism if you put it into mm -hmm. historical context. I think that was one of the cool things about the Hermitage when we went is that there was, um, they called them historical interpreters that actually like, there was all these articles about, um, helping someone understand like American slavery. Mm -hmm. And so, um, <clears throat> actually talking through like this issue, like I, this is a painful issue and kind of an incendiary issue for a lot of people, but let's talk through it. I mean, it happened. Praise God that it ended, but it happened. So like, let's talk about it, right? <laughs> let's just not pretend it didn't happen and burn it to the mm. ground. Right. Um, so yeah. Mm. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm really not like <clears throat> a cigarette smoker or anything, but I sound like it tonight. <laughs> getting over a sickness. Um, I found this article by a lady by the name of Sophia Nelson, and she wrote this in 2017. She's an African American lady. And here's what she wrote. I thought this was so interesting. She said, remembering is powerful. Remembering forces us to become wiser. We think of the words never forget, and we instantly remember <clears throat> 911 or the Holocaust. We connect because we remember. We look, we learn, we discover, and hopefully with little faith, self-discovery and humility help us grow into better, more loving human beings. We do not learn when we run from our wrongs. We learn when we face them. Mm -hmm. This is why I, as a black woman who is a direct lineal descendant of African slaves in my maternal family tree, my grandmother Viney was brought to America in the hull of a slave ship in the early 1800s, around 1803, we believe from Africa, and sold to the Henry Plantation in Georgia, I am opposed to the removal of Confederate statues in the South, whether it be here in Richmond, Virginia, or deeper South in Alabama. So she goes on um, to talk about how she she does feel that um, Confederate flags flying over state capitals, she's not in agreement with that. But she says, I'm not opposed to people wearing it on their hats or flying into the yard. That's called free speech. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um <clears throat> She says, just as we cannot tell people not to buy Nazi paraphernalia and collect it in their homes, no matter how abhorrent we may find it, we likewise cannot tell people they are not allowed to honor family members who fought in the Confederacy, or that their forebears could not raise monuments to Southern heroes like Robert E. Lee or Stonewall Jackson, both of whom were decorated and beloved West Point graduates and Union officers before the South seceded from the Union and Rebellion. Hmm. And then she talks about how when she went to college, there were people who didn't want black classmates at her school. And she said the people who hated having black classmates at their school didn't hate us because there were statues of Robert E. Lee or George Washington, our nation's first president, a slave owner on campus. It wasn't because of a general Stonewall Jackson monument, VMI or downtown. They didn't like having black classmates because they had racist hearts. They honored racial prejudice. They harbored cult cultural bias. That my friends is what we must work towards eradicating. And we won't do it by hiding from our racist, slave-owning, and segregated past. If we, tar if we start taking statues down, well, we better go for old Thomas Jefferson, master of a slave who was his mistress and mother of at least four children. And let's not forget President Trump's favorite president, old Hickory Andrew Jackson, another slave-holding, Indian-killing president of our nation. <laughs> hmm. So, yeah, what do you think about that? That's interesting, yeah. Um yeah, it definitely is a conversation starter, and um, those conversations need to be had. I remember, you know, going to Gettysburg up in Pennsylvania with my parents. I was probably 13 or 14 years old. I don't remember. And we were driving around Gettysburg, and we came up on this statue of Robert E. Lee sitting on a horse. And I just remember, you know, I just want to get out of there. Like, I'm just a 13-year-old just bored on my school yeah. at Gettysburg Battlefield. My dad got got out of the driver's seat and walked up to the statue, massive statue of Robert E. Lee on a, on, a, on a horse. And he takes a knee and takes his hat off and puts it over his heart and puts his head down. 
and he kneels there for a few minutes. And my mom, who grew up in Pennsylvania, <laughs> wants nothing to do with the Confederacy and anything. It's just no loyalties to the South. She's just in the car, just honking the horn. Come on, David. Come on. Come on. What are you, come on. And he gets back in the car, and he's you know teary eyed. And, but funny. it's just you know it's just funny because even in my own household, we were divided like a civil war. But as Christians, it's we have a we have a very awkward relationship with this because we should view ourselves as strangers and foreigners in this land and yeah. we should view ourselves as not really having a horse in the race although we have we we should be purveyors of righteousness of of dignity and morality as it dictates in scripture so we have to approach this with um with a, a great deal of humility and say um, things like my way of looking at this isn't the only way that there is. How does the person on the other side feel about this and why? Yeah, and like we talked lacking, about leading up to this. We're lacking that quality today in a big way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, lead, like we kind of led in with this whole thing. Of like the, the Civil War was awful and terrible and so many people died. I mean, people in Atlanta, as they're surrounded by Sherman's army, were starving to death inside that city. Mm -hmm. Men, women, and children. And you could see how that generational trauma could be passed down from generation to generation. So sure. you have to keep that in mind that when you're taking down a Confederate statue, you're taking down possibly a symbol of, of, of what would thought what maybe someone thought generations prior as a liberator from Northern aggression. And I'm using, sure. you know, air quotes on that, obviously, but it's like, we got to approach it with a lot of humility and say, there's a lot of emotion tied into this. We can't yeah. just say it's, completely black and white um sure yeah well even but, on the other side of that i mean i think growing up in georgia and then living here in rural tennessee most of the people that i'm surrounded with find it silly ridiculous and absurd that anybody could look at a confederate monument and see anything but um you know the war of northern aggression right they're like how could someone mm. see racism in that hmm well, just because you don't see it in that doesn't mean that other people don't, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You may be flying that rebel flag because that means you're a Skinner fan. <laughs> but you, your neighbor who's black sees you flying that rebel flag and they think that you're a racist, right? I mean, so mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. your way of looking at it isn't the only way that there is. And, and so like if I, if I am a, uh, you know, World War II reenactor and I have a, Nazi soldier uniform mm -hmm. in the trunk of my car and I'm trying it on in my driveway and my neighbor walks by and they're like, holy cow, my neighbor is just like a Nazi. I can't be like, oh, you idiot. I'm just a historical reenactor. It's heritage, not hate, right? I mean, no, like someone else's interpretation of what I'm doing is kind of important to a certain mm -hmm. extent, right? Mm-hmm. So I gotta yeah. have like the humility and like social awareness to kind of read the room and see that. Does that make sense? And, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And and so we should view ourselves as strangers and sojourners in this land. That the United States of America is not the promised land. It's not the end goal for Christians. Okay. Right. But also, um, we, we shouldn't we shouldn't be really big on stuff. We historically speaking, Christianity. Well, I can't, I can't really say that actually. We we should not be really big on statues, <laughs> and 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 I, I <laughs> right right. What is the word? Icon iconography. Like what? Yeah, yeah. Having lots of having lots of engravings and carvings and statues. We've just never, biblically speaking, the biblical roots of our movement have not been big on that. If anything, right. they've been <clears throat> prohibitive of that. Sure. So um, we should we shouldn't allow our emotions to get super invested in something that is. Uh, that is a symbol, regardless mm -hmm. of what that symbol is. But right. we should also approach this with a lot of a lot of grace, which says, I can't assume to know someone's motives for why they feel a certain way about this, so I'm not going to assume. Um, mm -hmm. That's what you kind of talked about with like the the uniform in your trunk. It's like their perception, their perception of that situation is their reality, and you mm -hmm. have to know it. You have to be aware of that. Um, but we have to approach it with love as well. And you could, that says, like, just because I have First Amendment rights to fly a rebel flag, if that hurts a brother or sister in Christ, 
is it loving to do that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you you may have a right to do that and whatever, but you've got to be <clears throat> sensitive and loving towards others in yeah. that and what it looks like to them. Um, and then have a lot of wisdom and say this is a multifaceted, complex issue. It may or may not be wise for me or for me, uh, like overly simplistic verdict, come to an overly simplistic verdict on this without exploring the issue fully. So yeah. humility, grace, love, and wisdom with this issue. And it's like, I, I have the saying lately, I've been saying it's um, in terms of like people with conflicts, it's no one is either all right or all wrong. Often is the case. <laughs> yeah, it's yep. it's usually very Sounds like complex. you've been doing marriage counseling with people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No one is either yeah. completely right or completely wrong. Yeah. Um, everybody's a little bit of both, and that's often the so, case with when humans get into conflict. Yeah. So let me ask you this. Okay, we're an hour in. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Hopefully, people have made it this far, listening to this conversation with Grace, and they're not ready to, you know, ban this podcast. <laughs> what do you think? I'll tell you what I think. What do you think about the issue of Confederate monuments? Do you think that they should come down and go to a museum? Do you think mm. they should stay up? Do you think it's always bring them down? Do you think it's always keep them up? Or is it somewhere in the middle? What do you feel about I, that? I think, yeah. So I think, I think it'd be good if it's if it's on public property, uh, like, you know, Munn Park in Lakeland, Florida, for instance. I think it would be good to have a series of town hall meetings and solicit for votes um, and see where the population of that city is is heading, where they feel about it, and maybe doing something like a compromise, like putting it out on the more the periphery of the town, mm-hmm. um, over you know near a cemetery where there are a lot of Confederate soldiers that have been buried, or you know for instance like the the military installation that was just renamed here. Um, I mean, how many how many millions of dollars were spent just changing the name? And all the right. signs and everything else that comes along. Maybe they could have found someone else named Rucker, <laughs> and just said <laughs> it's about Rucker? this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but like, like I want to even serve in the military. I only want to be with you. Oh. But I think I think compromise is probably <clears throat> a good solution to this. And yeah. what that does is it doesn't fully erase history. But at the same time, if a if a city or municipality has one of these monuments on their public property, um it allows them to express their opinion and their voice. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think that's kind of where I'm at with it. Because, like, I don't know, man. Like, I am I think when it comes to this issue, I'm probably right in the middle, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Love history. Love reading about the Civil War. Um, obviously, I have a family heritage connected to Civil War history. I grew up not far from Civil War battlefields. I mean, it's in my blood in the sense of it is like a generational understanding of this was a formative part of our family, right? Mm -hmm. Um, There's family journals somewhere that a grandmother of mine or a great, 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 whatever, sat on her front porch knitting and listened to the cannons in Chickamauga, Mm. right? Wow. So there's a part of me that like, when I see somebody ranting and raving that, you know, every person that has any interest in studying history of the Confederacy is a white supremacist that wants to reinforce a Southern identity that is trying to bring back Jim Crow law South or, you Mm -hmm. know, you know, (laughs) owning slaves. It's like, what are you talking about? Like there's so many jumps to conclusion that that person is making. Right. Mm -hmm. But in another sense, the way I grew up was much different than the way that someone else grew up that grew up in a, a black neighborhood. Right. Mm -hmm. And so when they were told about the civil war, it was not the way that I was told about the civil war. And so I don't know. I think I'm probably against just like tearing them down and burning Mm -hmm. them and saying, never, never speak of this again. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but at the same sense, like if it causes so much controversy to be in the middle of a town, like, like you said, like, is there a way we could, I don't know, move it to a museum or move it to a national cemetery or, you know, Mm -hmm. preserve it and keep it intact, but maybe don't put it in the middle. I I don't know. I mean, that's kind of, Mm -hmm. that's kind of where I lean, maybe not towards one way or the other, you know? Yeah. Same here. And, and for, to those who are listening, who want to just bulldoze them all down, let me tell you, 
with 100% certainty that bulldozing, pulverizing, sinking to the bottom of the sea, all the Confederate, pro-Confederate statues and memorials that are in the world right now will not fix the problem of racism in the world. Yep. The only thing that can fix the problem of racism in men's heart is is being born again. Yeah, amen. By under the under the uh, compelling uh, transformation of the Holy Spirit and yeah. being baptized in the Holy Spirit. That's the only thing that will fix racism in men's hearts. So yeah. it's a it's it's a exercise in futility. <coughs> otherwise, yeah. Amen. Um, John Piper wrote a really, really good article on Desiring God after the Charlottesville riots in 2017. And I won't go into all of it, but he gave four recommendations that I thought were really, really good. Um, first recommendation, <clears throat> recognize the richness of Southern culture apart from slavery in the Civil War. Like in the sense that you can be a proud Southerner without people assuming a proud Southerner means you're automatically racist. <laughs> mm. Right? Like the region of the American South doesn't have to necessarily be tied to that. <laughs> and assuming that someone who is interested in their family history and heritage automatically, that means racism, all that. No, no that's not what that means, right? Um, the second recommendation I thought was the most helpful. Consider carefully the criteria for which public memorials to create or to keep. And the three questions he asked is what reality is being memorialized? So are you really like remembering the Confederate fallen because they're human beings that, hey, we need to remember it. We like honor them, right? They died. Or are we remembering this person because we're trying to intimidate black people and putting up the statue is going to intimidate black people, right? Mm -hmm. Is this reality worthy of public admiration and emulation? And is the person who symbolically embodied the member memorialized reality so compromised with evil that regardless of the reality being memorialized, the person is too tarnished even to be used to memorialize something worthy. Mm. So in the instance of George Washington, he was a slave owner. Was the fact that he owned slaves so damaging to his legacy that we can't remember any of the good things he did because of that one bad thing he did? <clears throat> and then he says, reflect seriously on who should decide what memorials to create or keep. What do you, who decides it, right? A, a mob with mm -hmm. pitchforks mm -hmm. and torches? Mm -hmm. Because if we start caving into mob mentality, then... That's mm -hmm. a slippery slope, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Where's the rule of law or due process or anything like that? And then his fourth recommendation, I think you and I kind of landed here, preserve noteworthy memorials in an appropriate setting. Mm -hmm. It may not be in the center of a town, but it may be somewhere more appropriate. So. Hmm. Triggered. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. Everybody's <And> triggered. <clears throat> I was kind of nervous putting this up on the uh, social media just to see what mm. kind of hornets were kicked up. So, oh yeah, did you yeah, kick up any hornets? I don't think so. Not not yet. Okay, we'll yeah. see. It's still early, so we'll see. Mm. Yeah. Have you ever been to a civil war reenactment? I have. I have. Yeah. Yeah. I was actually sitting on a train in uh, Southwest Florida, and we rode through the, the Florida scrub on a train. And came across a bunch of uh we were actually a train was robbed by confederate bandits and they stole <laughs> they took all of our money and then ran off in the woods and then these union soldiers cavalrymen caught up with them and they duped it out right there next to the train and we watched it this is like a really 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 elaborate reenactment yeah yeah it was super ghetto super really super because the yeah, ones i, I went to were always like big fat guys in their 50s that were super out of shape and their uniforms didn't yeah. fit quite right <laughs> <laughs> yeah could you could you ever see yourself becoming a civil war reenactor you like, know <clears throat> i am so uh interested in it and mm -hmm. i think that would be so interesting to be around it but because of the fact like what i talked about earlier like the whole <laughs> unloading your nazi uniform from the trunk of your car mm -hmm. i'm afraid of being misunderstood you know and people yeah, interpreting yeah. it wrong so i don't know well, hmm. 
Yeah. Maybe next time you're up here, we can go to the battlefield at uh, Stones River, Stones River Battlefield, and we'll walk around, take the kids. Yeah. You know, I had to take a class. I had to take a Civil War history class in college, Doc, uh, Dr. Kim Snyder. Mm. And it was one of the hardest classes I took. I had to memorize all the Civil War generals, like the commanding generals, for Holy both cow. sides, for both sides in chronological order. Wow. Oh, and I had to visit at least three Civil War battle battlefields in that during that that class. Which ones did you go to? Hmm. I went to Dade Battlefield in Florida. I went to uh, mm-hmm. I, I went to um, Andersonville, Georgia, the POW camp, yep. uh, which actually isn't a battlefield, but it's a big POW camp. Yeah. But um, that counted. I've been to and that I one. went to one in Mariana, Florida. There was actually a um, about an hour from here. There was a, a Civil War battle. Really? Huh. Hmm. Hmm. I don't know too much about the uh, the battles in Florida. Yeah, they were more or less like skirmishes, but there were yeah, Civil War sense. battles in, in Florida and Alabama. Interesting. Huh. Yeah. Well, very cool. Well, Gabe, thanks for this conversation, man. Yeah. 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 I'm glad that God's changed your heart from the raving white supremacist that you are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord. That's how that's rumors a, start. That's a joke, everybody. So... Mm-hmm. Hey, if you want to weigh in on the conversation, and we'd love for you to, send us an email, beardsandbiblepodcast at gmail.com, or send us a message on Facebook, or leave us a comment on YouTube. We would love to hear from you, and uh, we will see you guys next time.